Escaping the Giant Wave by Peg Carrot, illustrated by John Sanford. Thirteen-year-old Kyle and his family are vacationing in Fisher Beach, Oregon. Kyle thinks his greatest challenge on vacation will be seeing Darren, a bully from school back in Kansas. One evening, Kyle is left in charge of his younger sister, Bibi, while his parents are on a dinner cruise on the elegant Empress. Then the unthinkable happens. An earthquake triggers a fire. Kyle knows a tsunami could be next. Kyle and Bibi quickly head uphill and inland. They join a friendly couple, Norm and Josie, and their dog, Pansy. The group survives one giant wave together. Fearing another wave might come, Kyle and his sister continue inland. Then they find Pansy alone. I felt bad for Norm and Josie, knowing they would be worried about Pansy. They'd been so kind to us. I wish I had I wished I had a way to let them know that Pansy had found us, and that we would take care of her and bring her back when the danger was over. That is, we'd bring her back if we survived. We went deeper into the trees. I felt as if I were having a nightmare, the kind where I know I'm in danger and it's imperative to run away, but I just can't seem to make my legs work. I wished I had paid more attention to the maps of the Oregon coast that Dad had shown us when we were planning this trip. In particular, I wondered what lay straight at east of Fisher Beach. If we were running away from the ocean, and I hoped we were still going in that direction, although I knew it was possible that by now we were disoriented and going around in circles, I wished I knew what was ahead of us. Would we eventually come to a road? A town? Farms? Or did these lonely road woods go on for miles? Pansy stopped. Come, Pansy, Bibi said. This way. The terrier, who moments before had willingly trotted alongside us, now stood stiff-legged, refusing to budge. Is she hurt? I asked. Is her paw caught in a bramble? I shined the light on Pansy. The dog was shaking with fear. It's okay, Pansy, I said. Woof! The sharp bark made me jump and sent a shiver of premonition up my back. Did Pansy sense something that I couldn't yet know? Woof, woof, woof! It was the same bark Pansy had given just before the tsunami hit. Another wave is coming, B.B. said. I swung the flashlight in a circle, looking for a safe place to wait. We were near a large tree, a giant old-growth cedar. I ran to the tree and put both arms straight out sideways. The tree trunk went from the fingertips of one hand to the fingertips of the other. Come here, I said. We're going to stand on the far side of this big tree. If another wave comes, the tree will protect us. It was a sturdy shield, but would it really be strong enough to protect us from a tsunami? Bibi followed me to the back side of the tree. Stand as close to it as you can, I said. Press up against the bark. Bibi stepped up on a large root that angled away from the bottom of the tree and leaned her forehead against the trunk. I turned off the light and put it in my pocket, then gathered the terrified dog in my arms and stood directly behind Bibi. I felt Bibi's shoulders shake and knew she was crying. Turn around, I said. Put your back against the tree and face me. We're going to make a dog sandwich. Bibi turned, wiping her nose on the back of one hand. Dog sandwich? You and I are the bread and Pansy's the filling in the middle, I said. Bibi put her arms around Pansy. Good dog, she whispered. You're a good, good dog. Pansy's tail swished against me as she licked the tears from Bibi's cheeks. I wondered how I could make up a silly joke about a dog sandwich when I feared we were going to die any minute. Still, my words had helped. Bibi wasn't crying anymore, and now that we were holding her close, Pansy had stopped shaking. If disaster strikes, I thought, I've spent my last few minutes on earth hugging a dog and calming my sister's fear. Those are good things, but I didn't want these to be my last minutes on earth. I didn't want to die making a dog sandwich or running through the woods or any other way. I wanted to live. I wanted to survive the tsunami and find mom and dad and go back home to Kansas. I wanted to play baseball and hang out with my friends and read some good books and ride scooter, ride my scooter, and... I heard what Pansy must have heard a few minutes earlier. Here it comes, B.B. said. We huddled behind the tree and listened to the second giant wave roar toward us. I could tell from the sound that it was higher than the first one had been and coming farther inland. Pansy began to tremble again. It's coming over the top of the hill, Bibi shouted. 
I tightened my hold on Pansy and pushed even closer to Bibi. I heard trees crash to the ground, and for some awful moment I feared I had made a terrible mistake by staying behind the big cedar tree. What if the force of the water pushed the tree over on top of us, trapping us beneath it? Well, it was too late to change my mind. The fastest runner in the world wouldn't be able to escape the wave when it was close. This close. The water thundered forward. I ducked my head down, shielding Bibi, and braced my legs to keep my balance. It's going to hit us, Bibi screamed. Small stones, propelled forward by the water, hit our tree, then bounced to the ground like hailstones. I closed my eyes. Pansy whimpered. Bibi pulled me even closer. The wave splashed to earth just before it reached us. It must have crested over the treetops, because now I heard water smashing down on the woods we had run through the minutes before. The ground shook as the water poured down. I heard crashes and loud thuds. Something more than trees was being dropped by the wave. Rocks? Pieces of driftwood? Charred timbers from the hotels? It was too dark to see what the wave carried. All I could do was hope that none of it landed on us. Water rose around our ankles, then quickly receded. And once the wave hit, it reversed course and hurried back to where it had begun. As the wave rushed away from us, we stayed where we were, fearing a third wave would follow. That was close, I said. Too close, Bibi said. I shifted Pansy to a different position. For such a small dog, she sure got heavy in a hurry. How many giant waves will there be? Bibi asked. I wished Bibi would just quit asking questions as if I were somehow an authority. I wasn't the expert. I was just a kid who no longer wanted to be responsible for his sister. I don't know, I said. If the worst is yet to come, we should keep running. I stepped out from behind the tree. Bibi did too. Thank you, tree, she said. Thank you, pansy, I said. If she hadn't alerted us that another wave was coming, we wouldn't have made it behind the tree in time. I tried to put pansy down, but she whimpered so pathetically that I continued to hold her even though my arms ached. I turned on the flashlight and moved it slowly back and forth. Everything's changed, Bibi said. The woods we had walked through now looked as if loggers had chopped down trees at random and left them leaning haphazardly against each other. Much of the low undergrowth had washed away, and what was left wore a thick layer of sand. A twisted piece of metal the size of a car's bumper glinted in my eye. I couldn't tell what the metal had been, but I knew if it had come down on a person it would have inflicted some serious injury. The ground was littered with beach chairs, broken bicycles, and other odd pieces of man-made items that had been lifted by the water and transplanted here. I stopped my light on a large rectangular piece of wood that stuck out of the ground at an angle, one corner of it jammed into the dirt. It's a sign, Bibi said as she walked closer to it. It's the big sign from the front of the totem pole inn. The foot-high carved letters and the life-size totem faces were black from the fire. The sign had been mounted on two tall logs the size of telephone poles near the front door of our hotel. I thought of the power necessary to rip that heavy sign free and carry it over the top of the hill. I wonder if Norm and Josie are okay, Bibi said. I wasn't afraid they weren't, since the wave had landed right where they had been, but I didn't say that. I didn't even want to think it. I couldn't hold Pansy any longer. I set her down. The dog sniffed the sign, then rolled in the wet sand. Her fur was a mess, but it didn't matter. She was alive. That's all that mattered for Pansy, and for Bibi, and for me. We were alive. I cupped my hands around my mouth and shouted, Norm! Josie! Can you hear me? My words floated away like soap bubbles. We'd better keep going, I said. No, I can't run any more. I'm worn out. There might be another wave even bigger than the last one. I don't care, Bibi said. I'm too tired to run any more. I need to rest. Her face was pale, her arms were scratched from running through the woods, and I knew she wouldn't make it much farther, no matter how desperate our situation. My burned hand throbbed, my head ached, and my legs felt like rubber. Bibi was right, we both needed to rest. I don't have the energy to keep running either, I said. If another wave comes this far, we'll stand behind our big tree again and hope for the best. Good, I'm going to sit right here and wait for Mom and Dad to find us. She plopped down on the trunk of a drowned tr of a downed tree.
I sat beside her. I doubted that anyone here would find us, but if no more waves came, we would just wait here until daylight. By then, surely it would be safe to return to Fisher Beach. I wondered what was left of Fish Fisher Beach and the town of Fisher. Had the small village survived? Was anyone there to broadcast an all-clear signal when it was safe to return? Where were Mom and Dad? Was the elegant Empress unharmed somewhere out at sea? Or had the tsunami waves destroyed it? What had happened to Norm and Josie? My mind overflowed with questions, but I didn't know how to find any of the answers. Each minute seemed like an hour. We sat on the fallen tree, listening for another giant wave. I kept the flashlight off, saving the batteries in case we needed to see. My mind was as weary as my body. The fire, the fear of a tsunami, and my worry about mom and dad had drained me of energy as much as climbing the hill and running through the woods had. Tired as I was, I worried that we shouldn't stay where we were. We ought to keep going. When we first got to the top of the hill, we should have kept running rather than sitting on the beach, or sitting on the bench. That decision had probably been fatal for Norm and Josie. Now we were sitting again instead of running farther inland. Was I making the same mistake twice? With so many trees down, the next wave would have less resistance. It might travel faster and farther. I fretted and stewed over the possibility, but I didn't move. Bibi and I were exhausted. If a bigger wave came now, we wouldn't be able to outrun it anyway. I had done my best to save us. Now I sat in the dark and waited. The only sound was Pansy's gentle snoring. Bibi's head kept drooping down, then jerking back up, the way it does when she falls asleep in the car. Let's sit on the ground, I said, and lean it back against this tree. We sat in the damp sand. My clothes are getting dirty, Bibi said, and my shoes are all wet. Mom won't like that. It's okay. Mom will be so glad to see us. She won't even care how dirty we are. I wonder if Darren drowned, B.B. said. He should have come with us. I'm glad he didn't. The anger in her voice actually surprised me. I didn't tell Mom and Dad the truth about Darren, B.B. went on. What do you mean? He hits me. At school, he sneaks up behind me during recess and he pushes me. Sometimes he pokes me with a pencil and if I cry, he calls me a baby. Outrage exploded inside me. I was far more furious at Darren for bullying Bibi than I had ever been over getting being hit by myself. I wondered if Darren had picked on Bibi because she was my sister. That possibility made me feel sick. I never told on him because I was scared he'd do something worse to get even. Remorse settled on me like a quilt. I felt its weight on my shoulders. I know this is a terrible thing to say, B.B. continued, but if Darren doesn't come back, I won't miss him. I wouldn't miss him either, but I hoped he was alive. If I never saw Darren again, I would always regret letting him get away with hassling me for so long. I should have taken a stand with Darren years ago. If I hadn't wanted to confront him myself, I should have talked to a teacher or my parents about the problem. I had always been afraid to tell him off, for the same reason B.B. hadn't told a teacher. I feared Darren would get angry and beat me up. Now I saw that there are worse things in this life than getting thrashed, and one of them is feeling shame for not having the courage to do what is right. I'm not a coward, I thought. I saved us from the fire, and so far we've survived the tsunami because of me. Darren's the one who panicked on the hotel stairs, not me. Why did I ever let him bully me? If I had stopped him years ago when his bullying first began, he might never have picked on Bibi at all. If Darren escapes from the tsunami, I vowed, I'll see that he never bothers you again. I thought you were scared of him too. I used to be, but I'm not anymore. Bibi thought about that for a minute. Then she said, if mom and dad don't come back, what will happen to us? I'd already thought about it, and I knew the answer. We'll live with grandma and grandpa, I said. They'd move to a bigger house so they could take care, take care of us. Good, Bibi laid her head on my lap and promptly fell asleep. Pansy draped her muzzle across my ankle and resumed snoring. I was more tired than I'd ever been in my life, but I couldn't sleep. I was too anxious. I sat in the dark thinking about everything that had happened and wondering what tomorrow would bring. Would there be a joyous reunion with Mom and Dad, or would Bibi and I learn that we were orphans? I loved Grandma and Grandpa, but I wanted Mom and Dad back.